Now that we have defined all the different components of an electrochemical cell, let's look more carefully at the thermodynamics associated with its workings. So first, let me talk about potential. And so a potential is an attractive force towards negative charges, negative electrons. So a positive potential attracts negative electrons. And in that sense, in an electrochemical cell, the cathode to which the electrons are flowing must have a more positive potential than the anode. And so we define delta V, the total potential within the cell, as the potential of the cathode minus the potential in the anode. And that is always a positive number, or else you've just misassigned which one is the cathode and which is the anode. By definition, the cathode has the most positive potential. Electromotive force, in, indicated by E, italic E in this case, is defined as delta V for an open circuit, that is one through which no current is flowing. It's not connected, if you like. The wire is not joining the two half cells. But that raises a question up, up to this point. And of course, we've pretty much dealt exclusively with what are what's known as equilibrium thermodynamics, systems in equilibrium. And we've tried to do a lot of reversible things to maintain equilibrium. But if electrons flow spontaneously from an anode to a cathode because of a large potential difference, how does one apply the principles of equilibrium thermodynamics? And the way to go about this, uh, conceptually and formally, is to recognize that we can insert into our electrochemical circuit a potentiometer. So instead of just connecting the two half cells with a wire, we'll put a potentiometer in the wire itself, in between the two, two ends, if you like. And we will then adjust with a counter potential in order to make the net potential and the net, the net flow, that is, of electrons zero. And given that, as we send the current to within epsilon, some infinitesimal distance from zero, we can define the electromotive force as the delta V that's being applied in order to create that zero current situation. So if a positive E implies spontaneous anode to cathode electron flow, then a negative E would be spontaneous cathode to anode. They would have to apply that. And we can relate this to the free energy if we have our cell on a desk at constant temperature and constant pressure. And so uh, a positive E, spontaneous, is equivalent to a negative delta G, spontaneous in free energy. And so delta G, remember, is the non-PV work, and it's minus work because it's spontaneous. So we want to basically equate those those two. And what is the work of transferring electrons from one potential to another? Well, it's the number of moles of electrons times the Faraday constant, which is the amount of charge on a mole of electrons, so 96,485 coulombs per mole, times the electromotive force in volts. And so in SI units, a coulomb volt is a joule. And so the operative equation then becomes that delta G is equal to minus N F E. And it's instructive to now look at this in the context of a specific reaction. All right, so we'll take a generic cell reaction. W moles of W plus X moles of X are in equilibrium with Y moles of Y and Z moles of Z. It doesn't have to be two components on the left, two components on the right. It could be anything. We'll, we'll see a few examples. But let's just pick one to work with. And in that case, delta G for the reaction is going to be equal to minus NFE involving the electromotive force if we treat these as half cells. And it will be equal also to, by definition, what is delta G from the definition of equilibrium? It is delta G zero, the standard state free energy change, plus RT log activity of the products to their stoichiometric powers divided by activity of the reactants to their stoichiometric powers. So that allows us to actually define a standard state potential. We should define the standard state potential as being that potential which is equal to, where minus NFE is equal to, the standard state free energy change. In which case, the cell potential, if we set up a cell, would be equal to the standard state potential 
minus, just rearranging some of these things, RT divided by NF, the log of the reaction quotient, in this case expressed as activities. And this equation, which is terrifically important for electrochemistry, is called the Nernst equation. And you can see that the standard potential is then minus delta G over NF when all the reaction participants are at unit activity, right? If all of these arguments are one, then you get log of one, this goes to zero, and you'll have E equal to E zero. And so one question in terms of, you know, discovering what E0 is for any given cell. We might like to have tables of these things because they'll be useful to make cells of particular potentials. Well, arguably what you'd do is you would try to set up a system where everything was at unit activity. But that can be a little tricky. It's, it's not so hard to mix up a specific concentration, but we know that non-ideality can cause activities to be different than concentrations. And one is a reasonably large number if it's uh, a species in solution. So we do have the benefit that pure phases tend to have unit activity at, at one bar. And uh, that makes them easier to work with. But what about solutions? So let, let's take a specific example and ask how we determine its standard electromotive force. So this is silver chloride plus hydrogen going to a solution of hydrochloric acid, which is a strong electrolyte, so it dissolves to protons, chloride anions, and silver metal. So if I write the Nernst equation, the, the electromotive force is going to be equal to the standard potential minus RT over NF. So in this case, there's only a single electron being transferred. This is a silver one. It's going to a silver zero. There's a chloride that's staying chloride, and a half an H2 is being oxidized by that one electron in order to give an H+. So we have one in the denominator. And then the reaction quotient is the activity of silver, but that's a solid, so that's one. The activity of the proton, I have to keep that around. The activity of chloride in solution, I have to keep that around. The activity of silver chloride, that's a solid again, it's one. And the activity of hydrogen gas, that's a pure, ga pure phase, pure gas, its activity is one. So I'm left with E0 minus RT over F, log the activity of the two ions in solution. Now remember that when we deal with electrolytes, we usually talk about the mean ionic activity, so log of A plus minus squared, in this case of a one-to-one -one electrolyte, and I can expand that into the molality squared and the mean ionic activity coefficient squared, and now I'll use the rules of logarithms to separate that, and I'll take the squared and I'll just make that a factor of two in the numerator. And what do I do with this? Well. I know what the molality is because I mix up a solution of a known molality. But log of gamma plus minus, that sounds pretty interesting. It looks like something we could get from Debye-Huckel theory. So remember when we derived Debye-Huckel theory, and I promised we'd see it in action later. So we know from Debye-Huckel theory that log of gamma plus minus, as the system becomes increasingly dilute, should go ultimately as the square root of the molality of the components, literally the square root of the ionic strength, which in this case for a one-to-one -one electrolyte is going to involve molality. And so here's how the experiment would actually be done. You would take E plus 2RT over F log M. So move this term over to the left-hand side so you can measure the potential of your cell you know what 2RT log molality over F is, and now you can plot that against the square root of the molality, so this has square root of concentration in molality, and you ought to see, if debye huckel theory holds, a straight line, and sure enough, as this becomes increasingly dilute, that's happening, and you can extrapolate that line all the way back to E0. Without a theory, without debye huckel theory to do that, we would not necessarily know how to curve fit potentials as we approach higher dilutions back to E0. Of course, you could try arbitrary curves, but the problem is it gets harder and harder to measure as you go to increasingly dilute because there's just not many electrolytes to carry charge through the solution. So debye huckel theory, very powerful here, very useful. All right, well, having uh, issued that pan to uh, debye huckel theory and seen it back in action, let's end this uh, video, and next we'll move on to standard potentials.